Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Hi, Andre. Welcome. Praise the Lord. Um, yeah, so we are going to look into the Word this morning, and then time uh, allowing, there's something that I'm hoping to do at the end that I think will be a real blessing. But uh, if you could turn with me this morning to Luke 19, and I'm going to start there. Luke 19, verses 1 to 10, is the story of Zacchaeus. So, um, it says, oh, actually, uh, before I do that, I do want to say, Des brings his greetings to you, and he, um, I think he's, he's heading, if not tonight, tomorrow morning, he's heading to Cambodia. He's going to be done his time in Vietnam, and um, he just wants to say thanks for your prayers, because he's really had an amazing time there. It's really been a God assignment, and uh, so it's kind of cool, some of the things that God is doing there, bringing 20-some um, more churches into the LifeLinks network. And uh, when, you know, you guys know Des here. You guys know Yorkton Des. <laughs> There's a different Des. <laughs> when he goes overseas, um, you know, he's just in a whole different element. Um, the anointing that's on him, the grace that's on him, and he really does have an apostolic gifting and call. And it just becomes extremely evident when he goes out into other countries to minister. And he's received there in such an incredible way. And I, I watched a little bit of video of him at one of the services. And man, it was like a house on fire, that service. It was awesome. Like the, the way those people were worshiping, it was just incredible. And so God is just having, or uh, like he's doing awesome things and Des is having an amazing time there. Uh, so I just really want to share that with you because I feel it's significant, you know, not just for him, but for, for us and for this church, right? And so he passes on his greetings and, and uh, he'll be home on the 3rd of April. So, um, okay, so we're going to start in the Luke 19 and look at the story of Zacchaeus. There's a few things I want to share out of this story today. And I have two kind of goals out of this message that I have to share with you this morning. Um, so starting at verse 1, we're going to read there. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was very rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd. For he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. That's Jesus. For he was about to pass by that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they, that is the crowd, saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, I will give half, will give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. I love stories. I love the stories in the Gospels because, you know, you get to get a glimpse into the character of Jesus in a different way when we read those stories, and I love them. And, and I've been reading them all my, you know, all my Christian life, but they still really impact me so much. You know, there's several things that we can, can pull from this story that are really significant, and I could preach a whole sermon just on this story, but there's a direction I want to go this morning. But a few things that I do want to bring to our attention um, are these. So number one, this man, Zacchaeus, he had an encounter with Jesus. You know, I don't think he knew that Jesus was going to stop. I don't think he knew that he was going to get Jesus' attention that day. But that day was Zacchaeus' day. This man 
had an encounter with Jesus. And when you have a real, genuine encounter with Jesus, everything changes. Things change. We can't have a genuine encounter with the living Christ and not be changed. We may not know exactly what to do next, but we know what we can't do anymore. We know we were going this way, and now we have to go a different way. When we have an encounter with Jesus, something radically changes on the inside. Repentance comes, just like it came to Zacchaeus. And he said, Lord, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone, I'm going to pay them back fourfold. Something really turned around in Jesus, in, in Zacchaeus' heart, and that's what an encounter with Jesus will do for you. Amen? He made restitution for all that he had cheated, and he made a public confession of his faith. Listen, Zacchaeus' change of heart and change of life was no private matter. He said, I'm going to go to every person I've defrauded, and if I've defrauded them, I'm going to pay them back four times. And he said, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. Can you imagine Zacchaeus, who everybody hated, going from house to house to house, because when you're a tax collector, you went to every house, and going from house to house to house and saying, I'm sorry, if I, have I took too much money from you? If I did, I'm giving you back fourfold. Will you forgive me? Listen, I'm telling you, Zacchaeus's transformation was extremely public. Everybody knew something happened to Zacchaeus. You know, a lot of times in church services, we have this thing where we all come together, we have church, and, and, and then, you know, at the end of it all, you know, someone will say, okay, now with every he head bowed and every eyes closed, and I'm not mocking that, but I just have a certain question. When you were sinning, did you not do that eyes wide open for everyone to see? I did. <laughs> so when you come to Jesus... It needs to be public. It does. And, and, you know, even if something in our heart is set free, you know, we can't enter into relationship with God and carry along with us the fear of man. Right? So Zacchaeus' conversion was extremely public. Everyone knew about what happened to Zacchaeus. They're like all talking about it. Did Zacchaeus come to your house? <laughs> you know? And they're like, no, I hope he comes to my house because maybe I'll get some money. Anyway, <laughs> everything changed with Zacchaeus. Just like the Gadarene demoniac that I shared a couple weeks ago, same thing, you know? Everybody knew. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, when we have an encounter with Jesus, things change. And the second thing that I want to bring out of this story is that Jesus doesn't see people in the same way that we do. Zacchaeus was probably very disliked because he was a tax collector, worked for the Roman government, kind of a traitor of sorts, if you will, to the, you know, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. Um, he was probably barred from synagogue worship as a tax collector, couldn't go to church. You know, uh, you know he, he, he was pretty much an outcast. And, uh, you know, but... <laughs> Jesus didn't care what other people thought. And, and that, you know, the thing about that was, you know, he wanted to see Jesus, but he couldn't, he couldn't actually kind of go in the midst of the crowds. He had to find a roundabout way to do it, right? Because of, of the situation surrounding that. But Jesus didn't care what other people thought about Zacchaeus. Jesus didn't see Zacchaeus according to the flesh. You know, Paul says... In the book of Corinthians, it says, I no longer know any man according to the flesh. And we need to be like that. We can't see people or we shouldn't see people according to the flesh. Because people saw a tax collector. Jesus saw a son of Abraham. Jesus saw something different. And the third thing I just want to mention here is that Jesus was about to pass by it says in that scripture. It says, in verse 4, it says, So he, Zacchaeus ran ahead and climbed up to a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass by. Jesus was going to pass by. You know what? 
There are divine moments in our lives and in the lives of those around us where Jesus is about to pass by. There are divine moments, divine intersections. That was a divine intersection for Zacchaeus that day. And we need to be awake and alert and our spirits alive to understand and discern when those divine moments come, right? You know, do, maybe, maybe you think that you can choose Jesus anytime you want. But you know that's actually not true. You, you might think, well, you know, I don't feel like choosing Jesus today because I, I have all these other things I want to do and blah, blah, blah. But it says in the Bible that it's not, does not desire, it not, does not depend on human desire, Romans 9, 16. Does not depend on the man who wills or runs, but on God who shows mercy. There's a moment, moments of divine intersection, when heaven is reaching and Jesus is passing by. Amen. We need to discern those moments. Jesus respond, or Zacchaeus responded to Jesus in his moment. He humbled himself, and he came to Jesus. The fourth thing I want to bring out of this is the fact that Jesus cares about everyone, about that one person. Like Jesus was walking through, you know, passing through Jericho, and there was multitudes, it says, if you read what was going on prior to that chapter. Like there's multitudes of people clamoring after him, following him, gathering around him, and... <clears throat> And he, in the middle of all of that commotion, he stops and takes note of one person, Zacchaeus. Because it says that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, that which was lost. You know, <clears throat> that word lost is the Greek word apol apolem apolemi, <laughs> sorry, which means to be violently destroyed and to be perishing. It's a pretty strong word. You know, like when I lose something, sometimes I lose my keys or whatever. They're lost, but I know I'm going to find them again, and they're going to be in good order, and usually I'll find them again. And I can go and start my car and do whatever I want. It's not that kind of lost that Jesus is talking about here. It's not that kind of lost. It's the no possibility of recovery kind of lost. It's a perishing kind of lost. Amen. So Jesus cares, and it says he came to seek and save the lost. Think about Luke 15, you know, we have the parables of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, the prodigal. Jesus wants to reach the lost. <clears throat> this story is a powerful reminder of how every single person matters to God. And not only do they matter to God, like God knows each person. And Jesus called Zacchaeus by name. Can you imagine? Like, you know, if you were Zacchaeus and you're up in that tree and uh, you're thinking, oh, I heard about this Jesus guy, that he's like doing all kinds of miracles and amazing stuff. And man, I just want to see him. So he climbs up in this tree because he's too short, can't see above the crowd. And he's up in this tree looking, just hoping to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops and goes, Hey, Zacchaeus. And he's like, How do you know my name? Right? Like, no one, how would he have known? Well, I mean, he's God. But the point is, he called Zacchaeus by name. And he calls each one of us by name. Like, when Jesus calls you, it's deeply personal. It's not like, Oh, you're another one of the crowd to fill a chair somewhere. Jesus calls you by name and cares about your life, and he wants you by name. He knows your address. He says, I'm going to come to your house today. <laughs> Jesus calls each one by name. Every one of us who follow Jesus are to be like him and are also called to reach the lost. Amen. 
In Christianity, this is called evangelism. It's a, a Greek word called eugelestes, and it means the bringer of good news. A bringer of good news. It's a unique word. But, you know, this isn't just good news. It's like the best news ever. Like crazy news. Like I, I, I just heard a couple days ago, yesterday I guess it was, that someone that we know in this community here won a million dollars, right? That's pretty good news. Like I can imagine that guy. He was probably like freaking out, running all over, telling everybody that he won a million dollars, right? Because that's pretty good news. But I mean, that news pales in comparison to the news that we carry as believers. Totally pales in comparison. We are the bringers of good news to lost and the broken, amen? The best news in the world that Jesus, the Son of God, came and took your sins and my sins in his body on the cross and suffered and died for you and me. And on that day, he uttered the most earth-shattering, hell-shaking, veil-tearing, and devil-terrorizing words that ever were spoken. Three little words Jesus said, it is finished. He accomplished your salvation and my salvation that day. And nothing could ever change that. That's the good news that we carry. Amen. With those three words, hell is plundered, sin is powerless, darkness is overthrown, death is defeated, and heaven is open to whosoever will may come. The fourth thing that I want to point out is he said to Zacchaeus, make haste. Make haste and come down from there, he said to Zacchaeus, because I'm coming to your house today. The matter of salvation for you and for me and for everyone is an urgent matter. It's an urgent matter. Jesus said to his disciples, don't look and say, oh, there are four more months until the harvest. But he said, look, I'm telling you, lift up your eyes. The fields are white unto harvest. It's an urgent matter. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, it says, We then, as workers together with him, plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and the day of salvation. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. For behold, now is the acceptable time, and today is the day of salvation. Why today? Why the sense of urgency? Because there we may not have tomorrow. We just don't know. Amen? Jesus gave so much for us. He gave so much to reach lost people, like Zacchaeus, like you and me. How much will we give? How much will we be moved? Amen. He went so far as to give his own life. How far will we go? One of the most disturbing things about Western Christianity is the apparent indifference of many of the, to those all around us who are lost and broken and who don't yet know Christ. So we have what is a bit of an evangelism crisis, actually, in the church right now. I've been studying this up a little bit. So according to statistics taken by Alpha Canada, an Alpha Canada report in 2021, only 9% of churches said that the practice of evangelism was, evangelism was a high priority. Sadly, only 4% said they thought it was essential. <laughs> Christians know they should share the gospel, but yet they rarely do. 
and only 6% of Christians will share their faith with someone in the next six months. When you think about what's at stake and the incredible The million dollars that has been given to me, more than a million dollars. Like, what has been given to me? What has been entrusted to me? This salvation, this good news. Oh, my gosh. Jesus wants us to share it and to have a sense of urgency about it. Amen? I just want you to look around somewhere close to you and take note of an empty chair. There's plenty of them here this morning. <laughs> but just, just take note of one close to you right now. You know, there's someone in your family, in your workplace, on your street, in your sphere of influence that God wants in that chair. There's somebody that Jesus is praying for right now before the throne of the Father with tears interceding for. We're not here by accident. You're not where you live, where you work, by accident. But Acts 17 tells us that God decided what generation, what year, what city, where you will live so that you could help bring people to Christ so that you could share the good news. Amen. We need to care and be passionate about reaching people. And it says in Roman 10, how will they call on them whom they have not believed and how shall they believe if they have not heard? Someone needs to tell them. So, <laughs> so we... And Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, he said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know what? I looked up that word go in the Greek. Guess what it means? <laughs> go figure. It means go. <laughs> You know, like, here's the thing. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. He said in Mark 16, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Do you know, because Jesus said go, you have authority. You have authority that doesn't just come from what you believe, your doctrine. You have authority that doesn't come from the fact that you can debate scriptures well. You have authority that comes from the fact that the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven that defeated all sin, darkness, death, and hell, said to you, go. That's authority. That is authority. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, go. But, you know, it says in Ephesians 4, 7 that, you know, God gave apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists to equip his people for the works of service in the body of Christ so that the fullness of so that the body would come to the fullness of the measure of Christ. And, you know, many of us look at that scripture and we think, oh, wow, whew, thank goodness for those evangelists. <laughs> I'm sure glad for those evangelists, you know. Seriously, I'm not kidding. Uh, you know, and, but you know what it says there? It says those evangelists are to equip the saints. The apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so... Um, that's why, you know, this is something, I'm sharing this because this is something that's been on my heart, and if you've been around here for a while, last couple of years, you know that I've been mentioning evangelism fairly often, and this is actually quite a new thing for me. <laughs> not, not to, you know, that I, don't, not that I, I mean, I believe in it, obviously, because I'm a pa pastoring church, I preach the gospel, but it has been on my heart in a way that I have not experienced before, because 
God, I believe, is really doing something in the realm of evangelism. And if you want to step into what the Holy Spirit is doing right now, then I'm telling you, step into evangelism. Be bold. Be brave. Step out and share the gospel because the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. And there is an urgency. Just like we heard this morning about these four young men that, you know, there was this accident. You know, we just never know. <clears throat> it's not about personality. Sharing the gospel it isn't about personality. You know, like, I'm outgoing or I'm not outgoing. It's not about that. It's about being anointed and sent by Jesus. Amen. Jesus called the whole church to help fulfill his great commission. Every saint is a sent one. Every saint is called to share the message of the gospel of salvation. <clears throat> Jesus not only commissioned the 12, but he also commissioned the 70. Like, so who were these 70? I don't know. <laughs> they, were, they were just disciples, just like you and me, just disciples. And he commissioned them and sent them out. And if you read about it, you know, in the scripture, that is in Luke 10. You know, he told them, go, like, heal the sick, raise the dead. And, oh, well, I'm like, wow, these guys, they're just disciples. And he sent them. And, and they came back, it says later on, if you read it, they came back marveling at the power and the authority that they had. And they had it because Jesus sent them. Not because of anything we have in us, right? But it's because of that. <clears throat> so why don't people, if this is such a critical issue, why don't people, you know, share their faith more? Well, I think that there are some specific reasons for that. And I just want to quickly touch on a few of the lies that we believe that prevent us from sharing our faith. Number one, we think people don't want to hear the gospel. We think they, they don't want to hear it. But you know, <clears throat> that's not true. Because Jesus said, the fields are ripe. They're ready. So that means if they're ready, they will hear. And not to mention that hearing comes by divine working of the Holy Spirit. It's God that opens the heart and opens the ears of the man to hear the gospel. So who are we to say that person's not going to hear? Whew. You don't want to see the power of God flow through you? Share the gospel with somebody. Just, just tell them about Jesus, you know? And even, you know, even if they don't accept the Lord right at that moment, that seed is there, and God, he can germinate that seed whenever he chooses. Amen? <clears throat> Jesus told them, Luke 10, 2, he said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers into his harvest field. A study done by the Billy Graham Institute quite a number of years ago found that 82% of people said that they would go to church if a friend, a neighbor, or a family member invited them. 82%. Like, I know that, that that stat, that's a few years ago, and that may have changed some, but what? But that's still pretty impressive, 82%. It's compelling. So, I want to tell you this morning that not only are we called to share the gospel, but it is our responsibility to share the gospel. God sent apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Every disciple is called to this great commission. So what do you have to give when it comes to being an evangelist or sharing the gospel with someone, well, you actually have 
a lot of things. And I'm going to just tell you a few. Number one, you have a testimony. If Jesus saved you, you have a testimony. Every one of us who knows the Lord, you have a testimony. And there is power in your testimony. Do you know that? There's power in your testimony. The testimony of, of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It sev- says in Revelation 19, the spirit of prophecy, when we tell somebody something and the spirit of prophecy is on it, then that, that means that there's power right there for God to do that thing again. That's, that's, what it, that's what it means. When you share your testimony, the power of God is released to do the very same thing again in the person that you're speaking to. The testimony releases the gift of faith. As Roman tells us that faith comes by hearing the word. When faith is released, the creative power of God is released, and this is how salvation happens. Jesus healed and delivered the woman at the well and the Gadarene demoniac in Scripture, and it says in those stories, many believed because of their testimony. Many people came to Jesus. Second thing you have is you have the Holy Spirit. We talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago, but you have the Holy Spirit in you, and it says in uh, Luke 1.8, I think, I thought I might have caught, cut off my scripture notation there. No, it's John, maybe? No, Acts, sorry. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's what Jesus said. Luke 24.49, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, and you will be clothed with power from on high. John 20, 21, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so also I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. You have power. You have the Holy Spirit. Amen. Third, you have authority. We talked about that a little bit. You're sent by Jesus Christ. John 17, 18, Jesus said, As I... As you have, talking to the Father, Jesus said, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them. John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Luke 10, 19, behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Jesus has sent us with his authority, amen. And number four, you have a mission field. Wherever God placed you, that is your mission field. Acts 17, 26, as I said before, he has predetermined and appointed the, time, the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of our dwelling so that we should seek the Lord. Your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, your community, this is your mission field. Amen? God has given each one of us a mission field. I can't reach the people in your mission field. You can't reach the people in mine, right? Because they're not in proximity to me. Or they're not in proximity to you. God has given all of us a mission field. When When we look at the early church, we see a culture at that time was one of preaching the gospel and sharing their faith, healing the sick, and spreading the good news of the kingdom everywhere. And that needs to be the culture of our churches today. Amen. So, in closing, as we're moving towards the end of my message here, I just want to say, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 20 says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us this same ministry of reconciliation, that, God, that, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, and has committed to us this same word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God we're pleading through us. Amen. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. 
1 Corinthians 9, 19 says, I make myself a slave to everyone, Paul said, to win as many as possible. And James 5, 20 says, Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. <clears throat> I've just been so stirred by all of this lately that, um, like, I've never ever considered myself a bold person or anything like that. Um, like, I mean, I've gotten used to standing up in front of people, but I've always been very much an introvert. And, and you know, like when Des and I first started pastoring, if I, if I had, you know, new people came in the church, <laughs> you know, like we had a pretty small church. So like, you, it was really obvious if somebody knew that we'd never seen before came in. And, you know, if a new person would come in the church, I'd be like, oh no, I have to go say hello to this person, you know, like that's, that was me. Like I had to overcome a lot of things, right? It's not, not been my personality to be outgoing. And, uh, you know, but I have just been so provoked in my spirit about what I feel like God is doing with evangelism right now and that there's really something on it. If you want to get into the river, if you want to get where the oil is, I'm telling you, that's where it is right now. Amen. You know, we got this Come Together event happening in June, and uh, there was one last year. This is really a, a, a really new kind of way that God is moving in our nation, and we really need to get on board with what the Holy Spirit is doing. Amen. I, I really feel that it's, it's like a move of the Holy Spirit. We've seen different kinds of moves of the Holy Spirit in times past. This is a move of the Holy Spirit. If you don't know it, <laughs> it is. And I don't know, but I just want to be about what God is doing. So actually, I'm even going, uh, in May, I'm going for a week to the, it's like what was the Reinhardt Bonnke Foundation uh, it's by CFAN, Christ for All Nations, and I'm going for a week of evangelism training. Ha <laughs> ha. No, seriously. Like, I mean, I take it that serious. I'm not too old for stuff like that. <laughs> I'm like... Yeah, like, come on, Jesus, set me on fire. I, I want to, I want to, whatever you want to do with me, like, you know, set me on fire and let people watch me burn. I, I, I want what Jesus wants to do with me in this moment, in this hour. How can I stand by? How can I be passive? When he says it's so urgent, the kernels are white in the head. They're white. And if, they don't get harvested, they will fall out of the head. Amen? You know, and so <clears throat> this morning, uh, oh, and again, I want to mention that, that, um, that Disciple of City thing that's coming up, okay? So we've made arrangements for this team to come to do this evangelism training, and that's coming on May 10th and 11th. It's free. It, it doesn't cost you anything to register. We will take an offering to bless the team, though. But these ministries are so fantastic. Like, they raise their own funds to go around training and equipping churches for evangelism. And they don't just, you know, teach you, okay, this is how you share your faith with Christ, in Christ, like share this scripture or whatever. But, I mean, they, they're, they're going to they're gonna set you on fire in the Holy Ghost. So come on down. You don't want to miss that. Sign up for it. Amen? It's going to be awesome. But uh, as I said before, one of the tools that we have um, is something called our testimony, and it's powerful. And, and I, I, one of the tools that they will share when they come, the evangelism uh, group, is uh, it's something called a 15-second testimony. And sometimes we feel intimidated about the idea of sharing your testimony, but you can share your testimony in 15 seconds. And uh, I have a little slide there if you guys want to put that up. So how it works is uh, you start with an opener, like... There was a time in my life when. And then you just use two or three words that would describe your life before Christ. There was a time in my life when I was addicted and hopeless. There was a time in my life when I was broken and full of shame. There was a time in my life when I was bound to pornography and, and alcohol or whatever. But then I met Jesus and he changed my life. And now... I am whole, I am free, I have peace, or whatever it is. So, Clyde, you can go ahead and play. And, uh, and you put it all together. 
into what will be about a 10 to 15 second testimony that you can easily share with others who need to know Jesus. So like for me, you know, there was a time in my life when I was terribly bound by fear, anxiety, depression, and I had no hope and no purpose. I didn't think I could go on with my life. But then I met Jesus Christ and he healed me and delivered me from all of that. And now I have purpose and a family and hope and I'm so grateful. Do you have a story like that? <laughs> if you do, it has power. You need to share it, amen? So, you know, what we're going to do this morning, just for a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to share your 15-second testimony. To just come on up here, one by one. You can see the framework right there. It's super simple. And I just want to give us a chance to hear the power of a 15-second testimony. Amen? So who wants to come first? Come on, Mark, you can do it. There's about a thousand things I wanted to say while you were speaking. One of them was, there's not one testimony in here that is the same. I don't care who's sitting in these chairs, you've all had problems in your lives. You've been desperate, you've been depressed, you've been sad, you've been sick. And uh, Jesus seems to show up every single time, or he, you don't know if he has, and that's why you're here. So that's something to consider. There was a time in my life when I was sitting up in the Redwoods, the most beautiful place in, the, in, in Northern California. I was strung out on cocaine been up for four or five days in a row sitting there with my dog Walter had a 45 caliber pistol in my hand went to bed with that every night because I was paranoid and I said well sh well I can't say that word here <laughs> but you get the idea I was gonna end the, end the sign out it's time to sign out because this is just stupid and I looked down at Walter the dog and he looks up at me, and he did, of course he didn't say anything, but I, he did speak to me. And uh, he's like, what am I supposed to do when you're gone? And uh, God showed up in Walter. If you spell dog backwards, it's God. And Walter saved my life. <laughs> Actually, God did. He showed up. So. Awesome. That was awesome, Mark. Okay, so, but just to keep it simple and stay to the script here, you only need two or three words. There was a time in my life when I was, two or three words. That's okay, Mark. It was great. But then I met Jesus and he changed my life. And now, two or three words. Uh, and then that's, that's, that's simple. 10 to 15 seconds. Go for it. There was a time in my life when I was completely lost and helpless. But then I met Jesus. He changed my life, and now I have hope. I have dreams. I have uh, just just a burning to for life that I had lost. And uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you, God. Amen. Anybody else? Just come on up. You don't have to wait. You can stand on the line if you want. There was a time in my life when I was addicted to alcohol. Then I met Jesus. He changed my life. And now I no longer live in fear and anxiety. But I have hope. And I carry the message to the alcoholics that still suffer. Amen. Can you feel the power in this? Come on. Come on up. There was a time in my life when I was depressed, oppressed, and suppressed. And Jesus is so faithful because he met me in a dream where the elders laid hands on me and I went down in the spirit and they declared I was healed. I woke up in the morning and I knew that I was. 
And that's the faithfulness of the God we serve. Because in James, he caught me up to it later. It says, get the elders of the church to come lay hands on you. They will pray for you. Your sins are forgiven. Your sicknesses will be healed. I was de delivered completely from depression and the drug that I needed to take for it. And I thank Jesus for all that he does for me. Amen. Anybody else? You guys are doing great, but we only need two or three words in each of those blanks there. Um, there was a time in my life when I was angry, I felt worthless, and I felt insignificant. Um, but Jesus gave me a purpose. He told me that I am loved, and he really gave me joy and forgiveness. Um, there was a time in my life where I lived to please myself and to please men. And uh, when I met Jesus, he really showed me the right direction and to live in a way that pleases him instead of just living for, you know, my own selfish uh, needs all the time. So, yeah. There was a time in my life when I was afraid of the dark. But then I met Jesus, and he changed my life, and now I'm a spreader of the light. Uh, there was a time in my life when I was, I was a teenager, just going along with the crowd, and uh, grew up in the church and just felt like God was angry at me. Just felt like, you know, that I, I just felt, yeah, I just felt God didn't like me. And, and then I learned that what he did with Jesus that he did for me, and that he loves me, and it's, uh, it's by his righteousness and not mine, and it changed my life. Awesome. Uh, so there was a time in my life when I was full of fear and anxiety, um, but then I met Jesus, and he changed my life, and now I have peace, hope, and courage, and joy. And you're awesome. <laughs> there was a time in my life where I felt rejected and angry deep down inside. And then I met Jesus. And I learned the value of love and forgiveness. There was a time in my life when I was facing the fear of the unknown. But then I met Jesus. And he changed my life, and now I know the peace that passes all understanding. Amen. Come on up, Mama. <laughs> Bless you. There was a time that oh, uh, I was brought up in a family where I was so much restricted to everything that I don't have the freedom. And it, it, I lived that kind of life for 20 years. I am always afraid and I am trembling. I cannot sleep well. I cried to myself because I don't have the parents. I don't have the brothers and sisters. I live to my uncle. And so when I came here in Canada, I, I, I still that kind of life. I do not want to be alone. I am always in fear. I call anybody. If somebody could help me, I am, I am already fearing now. And so <clears throat> when my daughter let me join this Bible study, and then, yeah, I have Jesus in my life. Many times I was already loss of my strength and then I shouted to Jesus Jesus help me I want to live I, ha I believe in you I have, trust, I'm, I have trust in you and I hope in my life and so that that one slowly come down my life come down my life whenever I have that trouble I always say this verse Philippians 4, verse 6. 
don't be anxious of anything, but in everything in prayer and supplication. I said, what is the supplication? You have to be, you have to kneel down to the Lord. You have to cry, and then you must be thankful and give your request to God. And so that is the verse that I hold it. And then that peace I live with you. I didn't give it to you. Uh, it is to come from the world, but I give it to you to to help you in trouble. And so God is so good to me. And now I already uh, I already what do you call this one? I have the strength already to the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I always mention the Holy Spirit. Give me strength. Help me to overcome my fear. And so I'm so thankful to God for helping me. As my age now, I am 25. I I said when I am alone, <laughs> I just pray past them. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the sake of time, we're going to try to do the, the three, two, three words there. It just makes it a lot easier to get the concept. There was a time in my life that I struggled with math. And then what happened? And then he kind of healed me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'll do it quick. There was a time in my life when I was mad at God. And he redeemed me. I don't know how many times. That's like three times in my life. I've just run from God. I was mad at him for lots of different things. And I always return. And every time I return, I'm happy. Awesome. Suzette. There was a time in my life when I was fearful had no purpose but since I met Jesus I'm filled with purpose and I'm driven and I'm no longer fearful awesome see how how easy it is and how powerful it is to share your testimony amen you can keep playing Clyde um, just as we wrap up here I just want to say two things first of all I really want to stir us all by the grace of God to be a bold witness for Christ. You have this treasure in you. You have the testimony of a life transformed by Jesus. And we need to share it with those who need to hear it. Amen. And secondly, maybe you're here today and you don't yet know Jesus. Maybe you don't really know him. Maybe this is the day that for you, Jesus is passing by. And if you're feeling that pulling inside, that's him calling you. And he's saying, make haste, for I must come to your house today. Amen. Even if you're online, maybe that's you. I want to invite you to surrender your life to Christ today. You'll never forget it. And he'll give you a testimony. Amen. It'll be the best decision, just like Zacchaeus, that you ever made. Amen. Let's stand, let's close in prayer this morning. And if you, if you need prayer, you want prayer, um, you know, I invite you to come on up and, and there'll be someone here to pray for you. But let's just receive God's grace this morning to, to be bold. You are commissioned one. He said to you, go. And, and God's grace, his anointing, the power of his Holy Spirit is with you. Amen. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you. This morning, God, that you've entrusted to us this message of the gospel, this amazing good news. And you've given us a testimony. And you've given us the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray you transform each one of us, Lord, with boldness to share what we carry to a hurting world. So, Lord, have your way in this place, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.